during a summer-long drought. A newspaper in South Carolina carried this story. About a hundred people gathered at the Lexington County Courthouse steps Sunday afternoon and prayed for rain. We had very specific prayer, said Reverend Hank Moody, Jr., the pastor of the Lutheran Church, who gave a prayer during the 20-minute service. We prayed for a gentle, soothing rain for the land, a rain without lightning and storm, a rain that would nourish the land and refill the ponds. The article continued, That's a tall order, and one of the National Weather Services says won't be filled anytime soon. Isn't that the way of the world? The world seems to say, pray if you want, but don't expect anything to happen because of your prayers. But by the next weekend, the city had gotten more rain in that one week than the previous three months combined. The rains came, but not without a storm. A neighbor lost a tree to the high winds, and on Friday there was a fierce but a brief thunderstorm. There are two types of thought, my friend, God thought and worry worldly thought. A useless human exercise is tossing and turning in the middle of the night instead of sleeping like a baby. You are tired. You need rest, but you're awake. You're wide awake, worrying about the pressures that you have, worried about finances, and worried even about not sleeping. The biblical term for this is the thief in the night. Your own mind is robbing you of peace and rest. The harder you try to sleep, the more you toss and turn. Perhaps we're looking at this in the wrong way. What we need to do is to look to God. But instead, we're looking to our own problems. Dale Carnegie said, If you can't sleep, then get up and do something instead of lying there worrying. It's the worry that gets you, not the lack of sleep. Job 4, verse 6, teaches about building your life on the rock. Is not your fear of God your confidence? Now, fear could translate as respect. In the middle of the night, do you respect God? Do you respect God's power in your life, in your problem, in your challenge that you're dealing with? Do you respect that divine power? Do you know what that power can do? Now the verse continues, And the integrity of your ways, your hope. When you stick steadfastly to God, everything becomes wondrous. Today is a tomorrow we worried about yesterday. In one of the glass cases in Washington, D.C.'s Smithsonian exhibit is a fur coat with a story. It is the fur coat of Marian Anderson, the great singer. It was her dream to buy a fur coat, and she bought it. There was another fan of hers at the time who never thought that she could do what Marian Anderson did. But she looked, she listened, she read articles about her, and dreamed. Her name? Mahalia Jackson. In the early 1950s, she found herself before a sell-out crowd at Carnegie Hall. And she said, as she stood there, she recalled gazing out at the thousands of men and women. She was just standing there as a baby nurse and a washerwoman. She stood there before the crowd, and she wondered if she could even utter a note. What was she? To stand before this crowd. Who was she to stand there thinking that she had the power of Marian Anderson, Lily Pons, or Caruso, who had all stood there on that stage before? After all, she was just a washerwoman 
and a baby nurse. And then she was reminded again. She was not standing there as just a baby nurse and a washerwoman. She was not standing there as just flesh and bones, but in filled with the presence of God who could bless through her. She opened her mouth. Now, she was a little shaky at first. She opened her mouth, and that first note didn't come out. But she kept going. It would have been easy for the human in her to walk off stage and say, Well, I tried this. But the human would think about it for the rest of her life. Mahalia knew God could do it through her. She opened her mouth again, and the notes this time came out. And soon the audience became excited. As the beat picked up, the people were clapping and screaming and out of their seats. She was, what many say, the greatest voice of all time. Mahalia was asked many times afterwards to go to Las Vegas and to sing jazz. One time she was offered what was a great deal of money to make just one appearance. But do you know, my friend, she refused to do it because she said, no, she said, I'm a gospel singer. I stand on stage for one reason, and that is to bring God to people. She said, when you sing jazz, what do you have when it's over? But the blues. When you sing gospel, you have something to take home. She refused to sing anything but songs about God. When Mahalia died in 1972, her funeral was attended by so many that the Greater Salem Baptist Church in Chicago had to hold the service at Chicago's McCormick Place Convention Center, a huge facility that often hosts some of the biggest shows in the world. 40,000 people came to her funeral. On her tombstone, this is written, Apart from Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. It can be said of you too. It truly can. When you're having great success and those moments are so sweet in life, remember why you got there. I sure do. You got there because of God. God is the great abundance and prosperity for the human being. If we will follow God, be loyal to God, and respect God in the moment. How do you rise above the conditions in your life? How do you rise above lack, limitation, and worry? You do it by consistently going to God and rising above former problems that before have trapped you down. Proverbs 3, 25 and 26 teaches about true security. Do not be afraid of sudden panic or the storm that strikes the wicked, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. And where is your foot caught? It is caught in the problem. You yank at it and you pull at it, but it's like a bear trap. And you don't know how to get it off of you or get out of it. It is true, you might have stepped there, but God knows how to get you out of the trap. Mark Twain said, drag your thoughts away from your troubles by the ears, by the heels, or by any other way that you can manage it. A lot can be learned by watching a professional logger. It's fascinating how they take apart the log jams in the river. There seem to be like 10,000 logs in the river, and they're all jammed. If we had to break the jam, we would have to go to the bank of the river and start removing the logs, but not the professional logger. He climbs a high tree takes his time, 
looks over the situation and finds the one log that is causing the trouble, blows it up, and then the stream takes care of the rest of the jam by flowing the logs down the river. What do we do in the middle of the night with our log jams? We go to the edge of the river and we start removing the logs one by one. We start examining each little problem, looking over each problem. In time, we will remove the jam, but we have worked hard and we haven't slept and we're exhausted. In this life, we are a professional or we are an amateur. What we need to do is to climb higher, to look over the situation, not with our eyes, but with divine eyes. And ask God to see what the blockage is and ask God that it will be removed. It will be removed in a miraculous way, something we couldn't envision through a thousand nights of tossing and turning and worrying in the middle of the night. We begin right where we are to bring forth the kingdom of God into our lives. Every problem of life can be successfully solved if we begin with God. Begin with God. Sometimes we end up with God as a last resort. This is the hard way of doing it, sort of the school of hard knocks. We don't have to do it that way. We can begin with God. When we realize that we can connect ourselves with God and prove what Jesus said, the words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. John 14, verse 10. Almightiness begins to appear. If you are given to worry and anxiety, think about the spiritual confidence and trust of God instead. Think about God instead of the problem. This will at once relieve your mind of thoughts that have stirred you and the power of God's Spirit will begin its work of straightening out your challenges. Everything will turn out okay. We all know God is here in our lives, but God has to be more than just a resident of your life. God has to be the head of your life. There's a huge difference of being there and being in control at all times. In the middle of the night when we're worried about finances or things going on in our life, we are all into detours. It boils down to living a life as a professional or an amateur. It goes down to the question, are you satisfied with the detours or do you want, once and for all, the direct route? The direct route is the spiritual route, the route of ease, the route where your burdens are light. Paul said in the Bible, this one thing I do, Philippians 3, 13. Most of us would have altered that and confess these 50 things I dabble in. We don't just do one thing. The thief that comes in the night then finds easy passage into our peace of mind. Leo Bascalia said, Worry never robs tomorrow of its sorrow. It only saps today of its joy. In Luke 12, 22 and 23, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. What Jesus is talking about here is all the outer things, all those outer things that affect us, the bills, the pressures that worry us. Think about God instead. God says, Instead, strive for God's kingdom, and all these things will be given to you as well. 
Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Luke 12, 31 and 32. Make purses for yourselves. Luke 12, 33. A purse is where you hold your valuables. You might not have valuables in it today, but you would like to. You have a purse inside of your heart too. And this is what Jesus is talking about. He says, make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near, no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Luke 12, 33 and 34. Jesus talks about this mysterious thing that few have understood about being dressed in the night. It is about those evenings you have a, a tough time getting through. It is about remembering God. It says, be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Luke 12, 35. Does that mean that you're to go to sleep with your clothes on? Are you to leave the lights on? No, it means you're dressed in God consciousness and awareness. How are you dressed? How are you clothed? You are clothed with what Jesus talked about a few verses earlier. Even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these, Luke 12, 27. You're clothed with firm faith in God, and you know every moment of the night and every moment of the day that you're protected, you're taken care of, and your life is sweet. Your lamps are lit. The illumination of God is on. How special your life becomes. The key to a great life is faith. If you want to open the key to, to new doors of possibility. The location of the key is remembered in church. Now, not necessarily the walls of a church, but the church inside of you. What are the four walls of a church anyway? They are what they contain. You attend your church to experience faith, but you're individually receiving that faith through your individual connection with God. You come to gather together with others to remember, and that faith power builds. It is a collective spiritual power that takes place. In the Bible, in Jesus' day, the word church was taken from a word that means called out ones. I like that because I believe when you go to church, you're called out. It is not by accident. You're there by divine appointment. Whether you're there for the first time or whether you've been there for many years, you're there to remember and recall your power and your gifts from God. Faith is awareness in you of the reality of the invisible. In today's world, we think of culture as ethnic culture, environmental culture, business culture, home culture, but the thing that really matters is soul culture. That's what's really going to make the difference in your life. How is your soul doing? That's the bottom line question. We are all the same underneath our skin and bones. The soul within. Is it happy? Is it enjoying this journey? Is it having fun? Is life sweet? It all depends on your soul culture. Well, the thing that builds soul culture is faith in God. When we have faith in God, everything becomes sweet and everything becomes profoundly good again. Rule number one, God is changeless. If God gives in one moment, God will give in every moment eternally. When we worry, 
We talk to ourselves in the middle of the night, whether it's verbally or silently. We talk long talks about lack, hard times, or even famine. We have to remember to tell ourselves this. There is no place for these things in the mind of God. Remember when Jesus stood before the 5,000, he had five loaves and two fish. What does that mean? He had, first of all, his five senses. This is what we usually attack a monumental problem with. But he also had two fish. The two fish are yeast, the multiplying power, and the source of increase. Jesus entered the silence of prayer. He knew and he prayed. What did he do? He blessed what he already had. Bless what little you have, even as your only asset in the middle of the night. You bless it with the power of God. And then you enter into the silence of prayer. And here is the key. You begin to speak. Speak words with power and authority. The two fishes. Power and authority. Also meaning spirit and life. You put God into it. You begin to feel your connectedness with God and know that you're a co-creator with God. You are speaking the truth and you're talking about your situation in a new positive, appreciative way. You are going to be prospered and you know that in the middle of the night. You're sending forth a spiritual, vibratory power that breaks down the inertia of the jam caused by thoughts of fear and lack. And there is a newness in you that comes in the middle of the night. Say in prayer, I am God's offspring, and I must think as God thinks. Therefore, I can't think of any lack or any limitation. You are now thinking, wait a minute, there is no lack in God. There might be lack in my life temporarily, but there is no lack in God. The only lack is my fear of lack as I lay here tonight. And I know that I can have more in my life. What power that has. Decree it so, and the Lord will bring it to pass. If any thought of limitation appears, decree this in prayer. I shall not want. I am a child of God. I am lying here, and I'm wide awake anyway. So it is a divine time for me to prove my Christianity. I am connected with God, and I'm going to see a marvelous manifestation from this evening. And I'm going to realize that this is the time. This is my moment, and great things are going to appear. President Truman used to say, the buck stops here. Well, in the same way you stop passing the buck of worry, you say with high confidence, connected with God, the worry stops here with God. I will close with 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6 through 8. So we are always confident. We walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence. And now, my friend, I ask you to join me in a closing prayer. I am, dear God, always provided for, and I know this now, 
and I will know this at all times. I pray that I'm reminded of this the next time that I need to know, even in the middle of the night. I have faith in you, God, as my omnipresent help in every need. I have faith in you, God, as my almighty resource. I trust you, God, to preserve me in abundance. I trust you, God, in every part of my life. And I turn to you, God, because I believe that you are a rewarder of them who seek after you. I give thanks this sweet spiritual moment to you, God. In Jesus Christ's name, I give thanks. Amen and amen.